Hello there, a warm welcome to Proactive London. And Robin Young is joining us today from Muir Minerals. And warm welcome to you, Robin. Thank you. So we're going to get stuck in and learn about what's happening with the company at the moment. And of course, mm -hmm. we've got to start with the situation in Russia and how that impacts you as a firm. Okay, very good. Um, the Since February 23rd, um, the activities of Russia within the Ukraine have definitely impacted us. Um, it's been widespread in that six different nations in particular have created different sets of sanctions. So every day there's a new restriction, a new constraint with which, make it, with which makes our work challenging. Mm -hmm. um, the sanctions themselves, the Western sanctions, have cut off all the large-scale Russian banks, as well as any banks that fund in consortium that use Western standard protocols, including a lot of the major Chinese banks. So on that side of things, we find it uh, very challenging to uh, work with potential buyers, potential purchases of, of our product. So on that basis, the Western sanctions themselves have basically uh, uh, terminated our ability to sell our asset and products into Western economies or Western companies. That's a major impact on us. Um, in response to those Western sanctions, the Russian Duma um, have created their own orders, um, in particular Order 81. Now, Order 81 restricts companies from having their assets sold on without specific permissions. So our ability to conduct a transaction, say the sale of our, our project, uh, we have to actually be approved through that process. And that's best handled by any company, the, the, any Russian company that we would be doing our sale to. Mm -hmm. The best targets for asset uh, liquidation or, or uh, sale is definitely to a Russian company, which we have identified. We, we have discussed uh, opportunities with various Russian companies. And one in particular, most recently, was we had a $105 million offer on the table uh, which we put forward to the shareholders. And at that point in time, the shareholders rejected the, off the, the offer. Why? Do we know why they rejected the offer? Um, the shareholders uh, wanted more up front. For they, they anticipate that the, the asset value is worth uh, significantly more in a fair market value. Right. Now, fair market value, we had determined by uh, Medea Natural Resources here in the city. And they had established that the value of the asset, if sold on to a Western company, would range from 106 to about $138 million. Right. Um, we're in Russia. So there's all, you're always going to have a Russia discount. Um, the, so as a result, the offer that came in at 105 spread over a 15-year period was just not uh, uh, what our shareholders anticipated, nor did they want. And, and uh, because of the length of time, um, it was hard to really establish if, if all the payments were going to be made, if there wasn't going to be some other additional serious threat or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So we've been asked to go back to our contacts and to uh, see if we can renegotiate any additional terms and to make things better or to identify another company that would be interested in the purchase of our asset at Kun Okay, and are you confident that you can get a, a higher price, which is what your shareholders want? Um, I don't know. Uh, we, we're in discussions with various possible potential buyers, but given the current geopolitical situation, mm. um, the, the negotiations are very tough. So, and we're in the midst, we're in the midst of discussions right now, and we don't know if we can bring them to a final termination and what those final uh, terms would be. Okay. Um, are you confident? It's a challenge. Yeah. It's a definitive challenge. Um, as every day ticks by, there are more and more regulatory constraints that are coming out of Russia, and they're not targeting uh, 
internationals are targeting Western companies that are still operating within Russia. Um, I have an example that, that Halliburton in particular mm -hmm. has a lot of equipment inside of Russia. They've left Russia. They want their equipment back. The U.S. government is fining them on a daily basis for not having removed their equipment. Right. Um, these are the kinds. Of, these are the kinds of juxtapositions and and real quandaries that are extremely difficult to to dictate. Um, I know that when we were in our first set of negotiations, we were a couple of days from having signed the the original planned purchase price mm -hmm. when the war kicked off. And we had to go back and it took us another month to go through all the documentation, make sure we had everything right. Everything was the best we could get at that point in time. Not knowing what the future holds, it's a very difficult plan. And we, we are working with people and we are in consultation with different companies, but I can't say what we're talking about, what we're doing today, but we are working on attempting to get a revamped offer. Okay, all right, we'll keep us up to date on that. I just wanted to question you on something aside from geopolitics as well, mm -hmm. because you have completed this TEO uh, project. This is the Russian equivalent of a feasibility level study, isn't it? That's correct. Um, the, uh, a, a TEO... Uh, there's, a TEO, pardon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's two types. There's a condition TEO, which is done early on, years ago, which says, can this project become economic? Mm -hmm. It said yes. So we've been able to, to pursue and get the final project TEO done. Now, the most important thing about what the project TEO is, is who puts it together. You have to use a qualified institute where they go in and they actually do all the calculations on the resources. They take all your raw data points, take a look at the metallurgical work, and they actually compile a, a full comprehensive study. That study gets submitted to the State Committee of Reserves, referred to as the GKZ. Mm -hmm. That State Committee of Reserves contains a panel of experts. For instance, there's a geologist, a mining engineer, a metallurgist, um, an ec economist, a uh, hydrologist. All of these people come together and with their experience, skill set inside of Russia mm -hmm. and take a look at the, they review the, the the original report, which was compiled by Oral for us. Mm -hmm. And then they go in and they say, no, yes, no, yes, and they make changes. And then those two banter the changes back and forth, come to an agreement, and then they go back, rewrite sections of the report, and it goes through another review. This is an iterative process. It takes time, and it's laborious because every document is paper. Um, all, the, all the documentation is handed back and forth in electronic form is unacceptable until they have the paper copy in front of them. So it's, it, it's a throwback all the way to before the Berlin Wall fell down. Mm -hmm. The GKZ has not changed its rules since then. The GKZ's responsibility, maximize protection of Russian government expenditures on a mining project. If it's a go, Make sure it's a go so that they, the Russian government knows that mine life is going to last for, in our case, 19 years, mm -hmm. um, and that they will be able to pay the taxes to the Russian government, to re and that thereby the Russian government recouping its funds that is put into the project. Those days are gone, mm -hmm. but that unit still exists, and that unit's intent has never changed. Maximize the tax flow revenues to the Russian government. In, in our case, that's, over, that's about 698 million U.S. dollars of tax revenues. It includes all sorts of things, social taxes, property taxes, environmental taxes, uh, royalties for the, that you pay for the metals, mm -hmm. the 20% the net present value tax, or excuse me, the 20% uh, net profits tax. When all of those are put together, they take a look and they say, okay, this project has a life of 19 years at specifically selected metal prices and using all the technical parameters. Um, in particular, we had a, we had a major milestone uh, a couple of years ago when, when Norilsk Nichols Gipro uh, Institute re re revamped our metallurgical flow sheet to include the ability to recover payable copper 
into a different stream. Mm -hmm. So that adds, so in the past, we never had that availability. Right. So bringing in copper and nickel enhanced the project considerably. Mm -hmm. The Russian government always looks at projects, what's the best thing at around 20 years when you're looking at large scale projects like we have. Mm -hmm. So they, they backed in, they worked the numbers, they looked at multiple options, and they came back and they said, okay, you have 187 million tons of mineable nickel, or excuse me, of mineable ore, you can put into the plant, process, and, and run it through the, the, the economic stream on a selling concentrate only basis, and that will net you 33 million net present value with a 15.6% IRR. So all of this work is done on Russian standards by mm -hmm. Russian experts. It's hands-free work on our part. Now what we can do is we can take the, all that study work and move it on to completing a mine plan work, which is the final step in the requirement of our, of our uh, uh, production license that we have in hand today. Okay. It's long, it's involved, and it's highly regulated in accordance with Russian standards. But it's got to be done. It's got to be done. It's a part, it's mandatory to every mining project in Russia. And I've, I've sat on panels with, with Russian companies, executives from Russian companies, and we've all basically had the same opinion. You need to get rid of this, the, the GKZ, because it's more of a hindrance than a help. Mm -hmm. But it's there, and that's what we have to work with. All right. We'll keep filling us in on your progress with that. Thank you very much indeed. That's Robin Young there from Amur Minerals here on Proactive London in the British capital. Thank you.